The City Club is always honored when Mayor Emanuel joins us. The most valuable asset of any leader is putting together a great team, assembling a great team. And we've got two of his superstars with us today. The first superstar, who's been a frequent speaker at the City Club, is, the, is Janice Jackson, the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. Let's give her a round of applause. <clears throat> She's the perfect person to bring the Chicago Public Schools to new heights and truly provide a quality education for every child, regardless of their means. Let's give her a round of applause. Dr. Janice Jackson. Another City Club speaker, Dr. Julie Morita, a board-certified pediatrician who is living her public service mission by serving humanity. Let's give her a round of applause, please. And she is so smart that she has her daughter, Megan Trick, with us today. Let's give her a City Club welcome, Megan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. I apologize for being late, but I was just at a the largest police graduation in, uh, in recent time. 315 officers just took the oath uh, to the city. I also see, I didn't see uh, Lisa. Uh, you want Lisa Morrison Butler also here from DFSS, so I want to thank her. Uh, I have a unique fondness for Dr. Marita. One is that uh, she is a pediatrician. I am uh, the son of a pediatrician. I know you thought I was going to say something else, but I am the son of a pediatrician. Uh, and uh, uh, I have a fondness for uh, Dr. Marita. She's the only one that got me to actually get a flu shot, since I don't believe in them. And she made me go do it, so you can give her uh, personal credit. Um, but actually, because I, I actually have a fondness for her because she has the same passion I have uh, for kids and their health. Having grown up going on rounds with my father, which was always a special thing to do on Saturdays and go with him. And she has also a personal uh, equal passion, if, uh, actually, if not surpassing mine, about protecting kids from the evil of, uh, and the illnesses associated with smoking. And it's a, a great... Uh, recognition that today Chicago has the lowest teen smoking on record. Um, uh, and we have gone to great lengths. Uh, sometimes, as Joe will tell you, the city council is tired of passing my tobacco legislation uh, and ordinances, but we have the highest cost of tobacco in the United States of America. We have the greatest restrictions in and around schools, and we were the first city ever to put bans and restrictions and also a new levy on e-cigarettes, even when the FDA was still fiddling around. Uh, and also now, just one recently, a court case, something we did two years ago, as it relates both to cigars, uh, smokeless tobacco, and other products. So we have taken it at all levels. But literally, I remember growing up when Everybody would say we would have a tobacco-free generation, and it was rhetoric. Today, we actually, that goal is within eyesight, and a lot of that has to do with Dr. Marita's moral and medical leadership, and I want to thank her on behalf of the children of the city of Chicago. And not only is, do we have the lowest teen smoking, we have the lowest teen pregnancy on record. We have the lowest HIV on record. Um, Ninety percent of the citizens of the city of Chicago have health insurance. If I had given you all those statistics, you would have said, boy, somebody should tell you about what their city is doing. You don't have to look any farther. That city is your city, the city of Chicago. And she's made incredible strides. I will also note, because I'm proud of this, is that all the revenue from the uh, levies we put on tobacco, 
go into providing free eye care for the children of the city of Chicago and the public schools. 55,000 kids every year get free eye exams and free eye care. Um, and for the last two years running, there are four cities across the United States that have won the gold medal from the Tobelman Foundation. Uh, for best health as it relates to overall for children, whether it's early childhood education, actual health care, and other type of services you do for kids. Every other city is on the coast. We're the only city in the Midwest, and we've won it both two years in a row, the years that Dr. Marita has been in leadership of the public health department for the city of Chicago. But beyond all the professional uh, no, um, recognition and notoriety. Dr. Morita is the uh, child of two parents who were in Japanese internment camps. She has honored her parents and their sacrifice by making a better life in the city of Chicago and by dedicating herself not to fame, not to wealth, but to public service. That period of time was a shame for America. It was a black eye for our country. And Dr. Marita has shown her parents that she would make sure that their sacrifice, their struggle, would be recognized with a lifetime of service. Your parents are immensely proud. And we're immensely lucky to have you. Now, you have to be nice to your mother tonight. <laughs> I know what it's like to have a teenage daughter. And I know what it's like to have a teenage daughter home from college. She's not picking up after you, okay, tonight. <laughs> I got one at home. I'm doing it all over the house. But I will say this as uh, somebody who's worked very closely with Dr. Marita, seen her dedication, her sense of professionalism. She brings something that's just unique, not just from medical training something that's very, very special that only comes from somebody whose parents have done, gone through a lot and knows that every day that you have to honor your parents in one way or another. And that special quality is what distinguishes her, not just as a pediatrician, but as a true public servant who is giving back to another generation of children. Dr. Marita. Good afternoon. I don't think I need to speak because I think the mayor said it all. He went through all the highlights that I plan to talk about today. But I'll say it again. Um, really, um, I'm sorry the mayor had to leave. It really, I am so grateful to the mayor for having selected me to serve in this role. It really, as the mayor had mentioned, I am a native Chicagoan. This is my home. And it truly has been an honor and a privilege to serve in this role for the past four years. And so what I share with you really is a story of successes that we have all done together. And it's really been an honor to do this with you all. So thank you so much. So before I start talking about our celebrating our successes, what I thought I would do is put public health into perspective a little bit, just to go down a little bit in the history of Chicago's public health system. Um, I think it's really important to know that even before the city of Chicago was incorporated in 1837, in 1834, the Board of Health was formed to combat cholera. And that's before we knew about bacteria and viruses. What they thought was that bad smells cause disease. And so the focus of a lot of the interventions that we had in public health were really about cleaning up the community and fixing the environment. So when you look through the list of activities that have occurred, you can see that in 1855, city of Chicago constructed our first sewers to improve health. Um, in 1869, the Board of Health instituted vaccine requirements, so policies to prevent disease. Not that they knew that they were caused by bacteria or viruses, but they caused that they prevented disease. And then in the 1900, we actually reversed the flow of the river to improve health overall. And then in 1909, we required milk pasteurization. So there were policies and there were systems that were established to improve the health of the city of Chicago. And a lot of the things were done without really understanding why, but we went ahead and did these kind of environmental changes. 
What you'll see in the next century was there was a shift in focus from some of those policy systems and environmental changes to really focus in on delivery of healthcare services because there was this need to deliver healthcare services. So the Department of Public Health was responsible for having a mental health clinic in 1959. We then also opened our first primary care clinic in 1970. And then, uh, but then as time went on, what happened is the healthcare system has evolved. And so federally qualified health centers came to be. And I'll talk a little bit more about federally qualified health centers later in this presentation. But I just want to plant the seed in your mind that these entities played a major role and began playing a role in uh, the 1990s. With the passage of the Affordable Care Act, that role that they play also changed, and there was increased funding to improve FQHCs and to increase the number of them. And at that time, CDPH partnered with FQHCs to transition out of our primary care services, and then also we consolidated our mental health services because our role really became more apparent that the need was to focus on the policies and the systems and the environmental changes, and less so on the delivery of healthcare services because there was a stronger infrastructure in place. And so that's kind of setting the stage for what we've been doing over the past few years. In 2012, or sorry, in 2016, we launched our Healthy Chicago 2.0 plan, which is a citywide public health plan that really helped galvanize the work that we've been doing with many of you sitting here in the room. And so I'll talk through some of the successes that we've had in, in, in that area and also some other successes that we've had as well. So what I want to start off with is really celebrating some recent successes, and this is where the mayor stole my thunder. <laughs> But if you look at your, and when you sat down today, we have a glossy um, brochure for you to review, and it goes into great detail about some of the successes that we've celebrated in the past four years, the past eight years, primarily. And it's really about uh, building a healthier Chicago. That has been the primary focus. And so what I'll do is run through a couple examples again today, just now, and then get more deeply into some of the bigger successes that we've had overall. So as the mayor said, we're extremely proud of this particular um, effort. Our teen birth rates are the lowest they have ever been. 24.6 per, per 1,000 uh, teenage girls 15 to 19 years of age had births in the city of Chicago in 2016, and that is a record low for us. Not only do we have this total overall city coverage level or rate that's gone down, we also know that African American teen girls rate went down dramatically as well. And while there ha still remains a gap, that gap is narrowing quickly. So we are making significant strides. This is something to celebrate. Teen birth rates at the lowest ever in the city of Chicago. <laughs> and this success is due to policies systems and environmental change. And you'll hear me say that again and again and again. Here's another example of a success because of policy systems and environmental change. We have, we have heard about lead a lot recently, and it's usually in the context of water and potential risk of water. But what we have forgotten to do is really acknowledge the success that we've had because of significant policies, systems, and environmental changes that have reduced the, the availability of lead in gasoline, in lead-based paint hazards in the home. And as a result of this work, what we can see is where in the uh, 1990s, we had one in four children had elevated blood levels. But in 2017, less than one in 100 children actually had elevated blood levels. And that's because of policy systems and environmental change that focused on eliminating lead hazards in paint and in gasoline. Another reason to celebrate. And this is yet another example of success. We have great tools to treat people to provide medical care to individuals who are living with HIV, and also to prevent others who are vulnerable to HIV from getting infected. Because of the policies that make these medications available to individuals living with age, HIV and AIDS, and also because of the policies and systems that we have in place to protecting those that are vulnerable, we have made dramatic progress, and we are committed to getting to zero by the end of the next decade. So having less than 800 people diagnosed with HIV in 2017 is truly another remarkable thing to celebrate. And this, this won't be the last time you have to clap, but I do want you to clap for this as well. 
I, I think well, the other thing that the mayor mentioned earlier is because of the policy, the Affordable Care Act, what we have seen is the impact on the uninsured rate in the city of Chicago. And so now we have 90, more than 90% of individuals living in the city of Chicago have insurance, which means that less than 10% are uninsured. And that is something to celebrate as well. So now what I want to talk about is getting into this again a little bit more deeply and give you some examples of how we've really used policy systems and environmental change to make the differences. So I'm going to give you a little more meat to the bones of how we had the success. Our focus for tobacco in particular has really been very simple but very strategic. It's been focused on making tobacco less affordable, less accessible, and less attractive to children. And so when we think about the different kinds of policies that have been put in place, it started really in 2006. It's hard to believe that just 13 years ago, you could actually light up a cigarette in a restaurant, in this restaurant probably, and it would not have been a big deal. But in 20, 2006, we actually banned the smoking in, in indoor, indoor facilities, whether it was a restaurant, whether it was a school, whether it was a workplace, which is a dramatic change. But very little happened immediately after that. But then Mayor Emanuel came into office. And like he said, he has been really passionate about this issue. And so we have worked very hard and very quickly to implement policies that make a difference in terms of making tobacco less accessible, less affordable, and less attractive to young people. So in 2013, we issued our, our flavored tobacco ban around schools. We also increased our taxes to the highest in the nation. In 2014, we followed shortly afterwards with regulating e-cigarettes Nobody really knew what vaping was, nobody knew what e-cigarettes were, and yet we could tell that this was going to be a problem and going to get young people addicted to tobacco and nicotine. And so we basically added e-cigarettes into the Clean Indoor Air Act ordinance, so we prohibited the use of these products in the same places as regular tobacco products were used. In 2015, we increased the e-cigarette taxes to make them less affordable to young people again. In, in 2016, we issued, implemented tw Tobacco 21. There's folks from American Heart Association in the room that were telling me today that t Cook County is now contemplating Tobacco 21 in Cook County, and we are hopeful they move forward with this policy because we want for the whole entire state to be this way, but the more and more surrounding areas of Chicago make it easier for us to comply with this as well. In 2018, we didn't stop. We continued working. We made a requirement for tobacco retailers to have warning signs about the hazards of tobacco products, uh, in addition to cigarettes, cigars, chew, other products like that. And then lastly, in late 2018, not letting any moment, any opportunity go, we are seizing every opportunity. We have the support of the mayor to get uh, policies passed. Passed, we increase the e-cigarette taxes yet again. Jeweling is a problem. It will wipe away the success that we've had addressing traditional tobacco products if we don't nip this in the bud. And so we have taken that very, very seriously. But each and every time that we implemented a policy, and Alderman Moore can attest to that, we've had huge battles. These were not easy things to do. And the only reason that we were successful is because we had all of you standing beside us, pushing back and fighting against big tobacco. We could never have had this success if it weren't for you standing along beside us. So thank you so very much for that work. And this is what we can celebrate. Another reason to clap. We are thrilled with the progress that we've seen. This is a prime example of how policies, strong policies, can make a difference in terms of improving health. And we are proud of that. Now what I want to talk a little bit about is how we improve health through system changes. Sounds really, really boring, but this won't be boring. <laughs> because, as the mayor mentioned, when we increased the tobacco taxes and we, when we created tobacco e-cigarette taxes, revenue was generated. And the mayor was committed to using that revenue for good purposes. So we increased the tobacco products and we the taxes on tobacco products and generated the revenue to support health services for children specifically. And so in 2011, when the requirement for all children to have, kindergartners to have a required 
vision exam before school entry, and only 9% of students had actually gotten that vision exam, the mayor said, we need to do something about that. And so what he did is he required that we dedicate the, the revenue that we generated from the increased tobacco pro uh, taxes to creating a program where we actually offer free eye exams to students in almost every single school and CPS system, and then offer free glasses to children who cannot afford them. And over the past five years, what we've seen is that almost 250,000 children have gotten eye exams for free in the, city of, in the city schools. And on top of that, 130 students have gotten free eyeglasses. This is dramatic. We've seen the success and the impact when these children put their glasses on in the classroom and they say they can see, see the board again. It's unbelievable. It's incredibly rewarding. But again, we didn't do this by ourselves. It has required partnership. And so we've worked with Ageless, Ageless Eye Care, Illinois College of Optometry, Chicago Public Schools, Catherine Hudson's a great partner of ours who's really worked tirelessly to implement, implement this program with us, and also Tropical Optical, who actually also is a great partner with ours as well. But in addition to that, when we increased e-cigarette taxes, revenue was generated as well. And so what we were able to do is the mayor required that we use that funding to increase school-based health centers in schools. So remember those FQHCs that I mentioned earlier today? Well, they are our partners as in, in school-based health centers throughout the city of Chicago. That funding went directly to increase school-based health centers with federally qualified health centers in four different schools in the city of Chicago. So CVCA, Drake, Steinmetz, and also the new Englewood High School will have school-based health centers in them to provide health care services to students as well as to residents within the community. So the other system change that we've actually done over the past few years is really improving Chicago's mental health system. So I'll talk to you, talk you through how some of those things have actually happened. But before I talk about what happened here locally, I again want to talk about the policy. Policies nationally make a difference here locally. And so you can see what the impact of the Affordable Care Act has been in terms of our mental health system here. More than 2.4 million people in the city of Chicago are insured. That is unbelievable. In, in addition to the, that increasing the number of people who are insured, the Affordable Care Act also increased funding to these federally qualified health centers uh, throughout the city of Chicago and also required them to provide mental health services. In the past, they only provide primary care services, so physical health services. But with this program, or with the policy, it actually requires that they provide mental health services as well. So what is a federally qualified health center? They are community-based health centers that provide comprehensive primary and preventive care, including behavioral health services, regardless of a patient's ability to pay. So that's regardless of a patient's ability to pay. Now, I know sitting in the room here is a, uh, the CEO of the Botanic Gardens. We were just having a wonderful conversation about an investment that they're making with Lawndale Christian Health Center, which is an FQHC in Austin. Is that Austin? No. Lawndale. Lawndale. <laughs> Lawndale Christian <laughs> Health Center in Lawndale. It's a indoor garden, it's urban garden, it's urban farming, which gives back to the community not only the fresh vegetable, but it's also a workforce, a workplace for formerly incarcerated individuals. It's an incredible investment, but that's the kind of work that FQHCs do in partnership with other organizations in their communities. So these FQHCs provide these services, and as a result of the Affordable Care Act, the number of FQHCs available in the United States went up by 80%, so they are much more prevalent. There are many more of them than there were in the past. And these are some examples in the city of Chicago. We are so fortunate. There are more than 20 federally qualified health centers within the city of Chicago with nearly 100 sites within the city of Chicago as well. So they are all over the place providing care, primary care, behavioral health services to individuals regardless of their ability to pay. Great partners of ours. So as in 20, as the Affordable Care Act rolled out and more and more FQHCs came into be, the Department of Public Health's role in delivery of healthcare service really was less relevant. We didn't really need to do it and it wasn't really appropriate for us to do that. So in 2012, we transitioned out of primary care services in partnership with FQHCs. 
But at the same time, we also consolidated our mental health clinics so that we could actually focus in on more looking at the overall system of mental health within the city of Chicago. We needed to understand what is going on with the system, where are there gaps, how do we fill those gaps. So what we did is a behavioral health assessment in 2015, 2016 and 2017. And what we found was that there's more than 250 sites scattered throughout the city of Chicago providing mental health services. And many of those sites are FQHCs who provide services to individuals regardless of their ability to pay. Hospitals, clinics, and also our partners, Stroger and Cook County Health, and Hosp Cook County Health System, um, they provide services as well to individuals regardless of ability to pay. On top of that, we identified gaps. So we do a telephone survey on an annual basis to understand what's going on in the community in terms of health outcomes and health behaviors. And the health gaps that we identified as it relates to mental health was that people felt that mental illness was stigmatized. Also, that residents don't know where to get care. And then lastly, the residents are worried about the health care costs. So what that made clear to us is that people don't know that there are existing services for them and we need to help them to get connected to care. On top of that, we focused our investments on assuring that the most vulnerable get connected to services. Not that they come to our clinics, but that we connect individuals to services. So we've partnered with different organizations to connect formerly incarcerated into mental health services as they leave the jail. Immigrants, undocumented, refugees, making sure that they have access and get connected to care. On top of that, we work with groups to help the chronically homeless get connected to care, really focusing on the most vulnerable individuals that need mental health services. And then this past year, we were thrilled to have an opportunity to enhance the system even further. So based on what we recognize as the needs within the community, we've partnered with NAMI Chicago, so Alexa James is here, great partner of ours, again, we've connected 311 to NAMI helpline, NAMI Chicago helpline. And on top of that, our investment will not only allow them um, to provide services but will, through 311, but also to increase their hours of operation during the weekdays and also open up hours during the weekend so we can really make those connections to individuals so they know they can get services, where they can get services, and how to get connected to care. On top of that, we identified a need for crisis counseling or psychiatry care in, in certain areas within the city of Chicago. So we'll make increased funding available to existing providers to increase their mental health walk-in crisis counseling services as well as psychiatry care in the areas that need it the most. And then lastly, when there are crises within the community, traumatic events in the community, Often there are requests from the community to provide behavioral health services within the communities, out of churches, out of community organizations. And so we have some funds allocated so we can actually help make connections to providers in those places so that we bring the services where people actually need them after specific traumatic events. So what we did is we did an assessment of what the needs were and then are filling the gaps strategically. And then we've made these resources available, recognizing that we need to destigmatize mental illness and also make people more aware of the services that are available. So again, really focusing on strengthening the systems, but doing it in a strategic and thoughtful way. And again, we couldn't do this without our partners, like NAMI Chicago, like Kennedy Forum, many of you sitting throughout the city, throughout the room here today. So now I've talked through examples of policies and system changes, and I don't think I put you to sleep with the system changes. <laughs> what I'm gonna talk about a little bit now is environmental changes um, and how we address environmental changes and how they help us address root causes of health. And what are root causes of health? The root causes of health are things like built environment, housing, transportation, economic development. Those are the things that we really need to, to address. And why? Why do we need to address the root causes of health? And I'll talk through the next couple of slides to give you examples of why we need to focus on the root causes of health. This sl slide is, of this, is an image of a central area in the city of Chicago with the green line, the orange line, and the red line demarcated. And what it shows is the average life expectancy in these communities. And what you can see is a, despite the progress that we've made with HIV, with teen births, um, with insurance, status. What we see is, and even with life expectancy overall, the city of Chicago has improved, but there are these disparities that persist when you look at smaller geographic areas. And you can see that in the, in the loop area, we have 85 years of a, 85, life expectancy for individuals living in the loop is 85 years. When you take a few train rides south to Washington Park, it's 69. 
When you go west to East Garfield Park, it's 72 years. So despite the policies and systems and cha changes that we've, and the work that we've done, we still have these persistent disparities. So there is more work that we need to do. And the way that we do that is by addressing these root causes. And what are root causes again? It's the built environment, it's transportation, it's housing, it's economic development. And in the past, we've really focused on clinical care or health behaviors. But when you look at this pie chart, what you can see is that physical environment, social and economic factors are the root causes of health, contribute to 50% of life expectancy as well as the quality of life. So we need to address these root causes. We can't treat our ways out of this situation that we're in right now. And so that's where Healthy Chicago 2.0 comes in. This is the plan that we launched in 2016 to address um, health equity providing resources and health services to, and, and programs and policies in the places and for the populations that need it the most. But we do that by leveraging data, by emphasizing collaboration, and prioritizing root causes. And I'll give you some examples of some work that we've done recently. So leveraging data. <coughs> data is fundamental to the work that we do at the City of Chicago in the Health Department. But it's also really incredibly valuable to our partners. And so it's been really important for us to focus in on increasing the data that we have available, but also sharing it broadly with our partners. So we've implemented this telephone survey on an annual basis so we can get more timely data on a regular basis. But we've also prioritized making our data available. So all the data that we have access to are made available on the health atlas. So hospitals, schools, grammar schools, high schools, colleges, universities, insurance companies, Partners throughout the city of Chicago, community organizations are using these data to apply for grant funding, to demonstrate the impact of their work, to identify areas of need. So these data are now available. Now partnership, I've been singing about all afternoon or all session long about how partners are so important to us. And we've been really good at partnering with external partners. We haven't always been so good at partnering with our internal partners, the city agencies. And so in 2016, the mayor and city council approved a resolution that created a health and all policies task force, where, which required all city agency heads to convene to come up with different recommendations to actually prioritize health and assure that as different agencies, whether it's housing, transportation, education, different apartment family support services, that they contemplate the impact of health of their work on health, which has been really, really fun. What it's done is help us engage more actively. And actually, uh, there's a number of different initiatives that we've done, but I'll focus in and give you an example of Vision Zero. Vision Zero is a partnership with Department of Transportation, Police Department, CDPA, to work together to address and prevent traffic fatalities, to get down to zero. We shared our data to help work through educational efforts, community engagement efforts, and also engineering designs within those areas that have the most traffic fatalities. It's been a real rewarding project, a lot of fun to work on, and just a great example of how city agencies can work together to improve health overall. Now talking about root causes, I do want to talk about root causes a little bit more. Um, so we know that in uh, residents who live in thriving communities are healthier. And so what we've focused on doing in the past is really engaging some of our non-traditional partners, and many of you are sitting in the rooms, in the room today. And this is Woodlawn Corridor Development Initiative is a great example of how we work with the Cook County Land Bank, Metropolitan Planning Council, CTA, to create an RFP for developers who want to develop this deserted uh, former bank in Woodlawn. And in the RFP, it was community um, engagement and, and input was provided so that it reflects community priorities, but also we were able to get the community and get our partners to understand there are health metrics that should be included in this as well, related to air quality, walkability around the community, access to healthy foods, all those factors as well, and that's built into the RFP, so whoever develops this building will have to contemplate those factors as they make this building. This is how we make long-lasting impact on communities and improve the quality of life for individuals in those communities. There's another project, and I see a bunch of folks in the back here from the Elevated Initiative, which is really another example of a transit-oriented development initiative in the city of Chicago, where we were invited to participate to share there are data to put, provide health input into a project that really focuses on developing communities, developing half-mile radii 
around uh, seven different train stations in four different communities in the city of Chicago. This is critical work that will have long-lasting impact, and it's work that we have never done before, and we were thrilled to be a partner. And then the last example that I'll share with you is the flexible housing pool. We know that if you have a home, you will be healthier. And so Department of Family and Support Services, OBM, Department of Planning, CHA, CDPH, we all came together to create a flexible housing pool, which creates 50, the pool of money that we have right now is $1.8 million, it is city dollars, pooled together to provide 50 more units of housing for those individuals who have substance use disorder, serious mental illness, or who are just as involved, who don't qualify for HUD funding ordinarily. So this pool of funding has been made available to do that. On top of that, in addition to that funding that we have ourselves, we've also got other partners who have joined us at the table in terms of providing funding. Blue Cross Blue Shield will be contributing as well. Cook County Health is also contributing funding to this pool as well. We have two other health systems that are very close to making a commitment, and we were really excited and wanted to share that, but I can't today. <laughs> But these are, this is the evidence of the, of the progress that we can make, and this is the long-lasting impact that we can make as well. And I neglected to mention that we couldn't have done this work without the support of our partners in the foundations. Sprague Institute, Polk Brothers, um, Michael Reese Health Trust have all been significant partners in terms of supporting the planning that went into this initiative. So again, these long-lasting initiatives that will have an impact on improving health overall in the city of Chicago have been done, but because of partnerships with all of you. So what's next? We've had major progress. It's great to see what we've done with teen births, HIV, um, with uninsurance status, with tobacco. Great, great progress, but what's next? There are still some challenges. So when we look at the progress that we've made, we know it was policies, systems, and environmental change that led to the success that we've had thus far. We need to use those same kind of approaches as we approach these problems as well. Obesity remains a problem. Opioids is a problem, despite the fact that we have poured a lot more money into increasing medication-assisted treatment, um, making sure naloxone is available to individuals to reverse overdoses, to also to creating the first farm rep license in the city of Chicago that really requires responsible marketing to healthcare providers. Despite that progress, our We've seen some slowing of the opioid crisis and the epidemic, but we're still not where we want to see where it's going down. So we have more work to do. Infant mortality, we've made progress, there's more work to do. Violence in the city of Chicago has improved, but we still have more work to do. So how do we get there? So I am a broken record. <laughs> we will use policies, systems, and environmental change, our public health approaches to address these problems, because we know that we need to do that. And we also need to use these approaches as we focus on root causes of health. So it's the built environment, it's community development, it's housing, it's transportation, it's structural racism. We need to address all these things using policies, systems, and environmental changes, and we will have success. But we won't have that success unless we, if we, unless we engage with all of you and other partners throughout the city of Chicago. So I thank you for all that you've done so far and I look forward to working with you as we move forward over time. And as my favorite Chicago athlete had said, talent win game, wins games, but teamwork wins championships. And so with you all, I am sure that we will win the championship and improve the health within the city of Chicago. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Marita. Thank you very much. And now we have time for some questions. If anybody has any questions that they would like to ask of Dr. Marita, just put up your blue slip and staff will, I see they're making the rounds now, will come up here and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. <clears throat> okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Terrific. Oh, here come some questions. Thank you, Amanda. This is our executive director, Amanda Gosti. She's responsible for marshalling all of our staff so that we do programs like this. 
not an easy job because we had 90 programs last year. Okay, this is from Evan Williamson, City Club member with the Ounce of Prevention Fund. What role do you think education, especially early childhood education, has to play in establishing health equity? That's a fantastic question. If I didn't say education was a root cause, I should have. It is among the many root causes of health. And so uh, early education is one of the most fundamental things that we can do is assuring that there's early education opportunities for everyone in the city of Chicago. That is foundational. And so when the mayor talks about his early education, he may not link it, his support of early childhood education, he may not link it to health, but in my heart, I'm leaping for joy because I recognize that when we get our children have access to early education, it really will lead to lifelong improvements in terms of health as well. I think one of the other things that we're really focusing on in the coming year that I wasn't really prepared to talk about or announce specifically, we are looking at a new model for home visiting. We will actually be doing, we want to move to a universal home visiting type of program where we're actually able to provide home visits to all mothers so that we can start the connection to services at birth and through the continuum of early childhood education, primary education, secondary education, and onwards. So it's really that continuum and I think it's critical, really, really critical. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is from City Club member Daniel Hostetler who's with the Above and Beyond Family Recovery Center. Question deals with the opioid epidemic. It seems like most attention is going towards MAT. Some of us may need an explanation of what MAT is. How can we put more emphasis on the behavioral aspects of opioid use disorder? That is counseling, case management, peer-to-peer, -peer, et cetera. That's a great question, and I know above and beyond well, you do fantastic work that is not necessarily medication-assisted treatment. What medication-assisted treatment is medications that help prevent individual, individuals from suffering from the side effects of withdrawal. And so that in conjunction with the behavioral services are really, really critical. And so we emphasize medication-assisted treatment because it really had been underutilized, whereas the counseling services had really been utilized more heavily, not that it was optimal. So it's only because we're trying to catch up with the behavioral health services aspect or the counseling services aspect and the social services aspect that we really emphasize the medication-assisted treatment. But as that ramps up, what the focus really is on having both, combined medication-assisted treatment services as well as the social services and the behavioral health support as well. Hey, thank you. Very good. Uh, this is from Dominique Stewart. Dominique, where are you? Back there on my right. She's with the CFP CC Industries. Can you talk about the Office of Violence Prevention and the strategic direction how this office works with other departments in the city and communities at large? So, so for those of you that don't know, um, this and the last budget process, the mayor's office created a new office of violence prevention that will be housed out of the mayor's office, which is essential. Um, the because violence prevention is really an, uh, requires a comprehensive type of approach with many city agencies working together, whether it's police, Department of Family Support Services, CDPH, everybody needs to be working together. It really requires an overall coordination, and having an office within the mayor mayor's office is really, really essential. And so as this this office builds up, actually there's, this week there is a convening uh, strategic planning meeting with all the different departments that get together to actually talk about what this office looks like and how we best work together. It's really essential and I'm so thrilled that they're doing it because we do a lot of work in our own office of violence prevention, but we don't do everything and we really need to have our efforts coordinated. So I'm really looking forward to having that office of violence prevention. Great, okay. Um, this is from uh, Dennis Gregert, City Club member. Dennis, where are you sitting? He's over there, good. Uh, what plans and policies are being considered to address the problems likely to arise with the legalization of marijuana, particularly for younger people? That is the uh, legalization of marijuana will require 
close monitoring. I think we have to have a strong policy, uh, strong rules and regulations in place to make sure that it's really handled appropriately. The beautiful thing is that we're not the first to do it. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in Colorado, in California, in Maine, in different states that have already legalized marijuana, so we don't need to, uh, we don't, I laugh at my daughter goes to school in Maine. <laughs> hey, she's a black bear, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to point fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but I think because of <laughs> field investigator. <laughs> So there's a lot of lessons to be learned, and I, there are many public health entities that have worked together in anticipation of this, and there's a really nice comprehensive uh, uh, policy brief that really summarizes things to consider as marijuana legalization occurs within the, city, in the state of Illinois, and so I don't think we're going to come into it blindly. I think we will come, we, will, we need to move forward carefully and thoughtfully to make sure that it's done well and responsibly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is from one of your uh, colleagues, and um, uh, I'm sure the Cook County Health and Services and that have been very helpful and cooperative. So Jay Shannon wants to know, if you could talk a little bit about funding for public health at a local and national level, particularly in this atmosphere with the President, the Senate, the House, and so on. Just a short question. <laughs> So first of all, we are close partners with Cook County Health. Um, even if my husband didn't work there, we would still be close partners <laughs> with Cook County Health. But it, uh, it, so many initiatives across the spectrum of things that we work on, whether it's HIV or mental health, it's just a, a broad array of things that we do together and it's been a lot of fun. Um, the, Public health funding is always at risk. So what I didn't mention as part of the Affordable Care Act is that there is a prevention and public health fund that is a critical piece of the Affordable Care Act. And a huge portion of CDC's budget actually comes from that prevention and public health fund. And yet that's always at risk. Even when ACA was not being challenged in its totality, the public health fund was being challenged. And it funds critical things like immunization work, HIV prevention work, um, opioid work. It funds so many different things. So there's always threats to it. So we are constantly working with our partners who can advocate and do advocacy at the federal level to actually advocate for continuation of funding and increases in funding. The city of Chicago is really fortunate because we get direct funding from most of the federal agencies. So from CEC, from HRSA, from HUD, we get funding directly to us, whereas the rest of the state is funded through the state. But uh, we continue to push as hard as we can with our partners at the, the agencies, but then also with our partners to push at a higher level to make sure that the funding continues. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this question is from Lynette Morris with Davidoff Strategies. Lynette, where are you at? I'm proxy. Right there, proxy. Oh, yeah, you told me you'd and I always read your questions because you print very well, so I can... <laughs> Thanks a lot. What role do you see for the business sector in partnering with public health infrastructure to improve population health? And are there potential obstacles to this kind of partnership? That's a complicated question. I feel like the business sector has a major role to, play, to play in improving community health. Because as we talk about partners, we've been able to engage actively with healthcare systems, with um, philanthropy, uh, a lot of different partners have come to the table, to community organizations, advocacy groups all come to the table. Where we don't really have that good of engagement is with the business sector. Because I think if you look at corporate uh, social responsibility opportunities, you look at different portfolios, I get so many different brochures from corporations that send me, look at what we're doing for our communities, and what they're doing is they're giving turkey giveaways or coat drives, and which are all really important things to do, but do they make long-lasting impact within the communities themselves? And what I'd like to see is a shift in business sector investment in community itself, community development in a meaningful way. The West Side United is actually a great example of an effort that county is part of, UIC, UI Health is part of, Rush is really spearheading, Lurie's a part of as well, where they're really working together to improve the community conditions on the west side of Chicago by investing in the community in terms of workforce development, education, true investment within the community. And I'd love to see some non-specifically healthcare sector 
business people investing in communities because when communities are strong, big businesses do better. And I'd love to see more of that happen. Okay, very good. We just have time for two more questions. And um, one, there are a lot of people here, there are a lot of um, women here today um, who are working in public private sector, um, who are parents. And the question is really a time management question. Megan, you could vouch for this or tell us about it. But how does someone with a position like yours, and over the years, the many important positions you have, balance personal and your public activities? Sort of a time management question. Family first. Um, I, and I'm blessed. Um, that my husband, who is a physician as well, and a very, very busy physician as well, has been a great partner. So a partnership per pervades through all my comments, but <laughs> without him, we could not have had a family and had two careers, because I think without, it was really a matter of balance. It's a, it's a shared responsibility. Everything that we do is shared, and so it, it really was not. And then, then I also have a strong infrastructure, because I have my parents, who the mayor mentioned earlier, are 90 years old and 85 years old and healthy and living two blocks away from us and so they've always been there for us as well and so it's that kind of support that's really allowed both my husband and me to, to thrive and I think we did well by our children. Yeah. <laughs> we think you did also. Megan, right? Okay. Very last question before we get to our closing events. Joanne Smith with Thresholds. Joanne, where are you? Straight back. This is an easy one. Will your PowerPoint be available? Yes. Yes. The yes, answer yes, is yes. yes. Okay, that'll be great. Um,